chapter 5. It is the um, story of the crippled man, the lame man, that lay by the pool of Bethesda. I preach from this chapter a number of times uh, through the years. This is the only place in your Bible that you have this story. Most stories or parables in the Bible you'll have two or three times. This is the only place in your Bible that this story exists. And so the Bible says, you know, that every word be established by two or three witnesses. And uh, we're, we're, not, we're not at that place. We only have one here. We don't, we don't have two or three. This is the one that we have. And, and, so, and so we have to stay with this one. We can't really interpret a whole lot more from this. It has to be from just this one. And, and so, you know, to, to explain it, you would have to have more Bible to explain it. Remember, the Word of God is its best dictionary. If you want to find where uh, the, the, the Bible is a supernatural book, it's not. It's not a regular book. It's not like any other book. It is a supernatural book. And so the Bible says the natural, the natural man can't, can't understand this book. And so you have to let God uh, reveal it to you. There are all kinds of um, comments upon this Bible. Yes. All kind of comments upon, upon this, this Bible story. But that's all they are, are comments on this Bible story. Because there's no other part in the Bible that even refers to this. It's just, it's just this book right here. Let's stop and pray, all right? Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the word of God. We pray that God, you'll bless the word of God, use the word of God to thy glory, to help thy people, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We done? Yes, sir. Okay, that's all right. We'll, that, that's fine. We'll leave it like it is, Brother Jeremy. All right, so I'm going to be reading this morning from my pulpit Bible. Every now and then I like, I like to get out the pulpit Bible and read from it. Uh, before, you, there were people who had uh, Bibles in their hands. Years ago, Nobody, no homes had Bibles. You didn't have Bibles. You weren't allowed to have Bibles. They, they couldn't print them. And so if you wanted to read the Bible, you had to go to your church and get permission to read it. And you see this big space up here. There was a big chain and a padlock that went through and chained the Bible to the pulpit. That's, that's, that's how precious they were. They, they were worth a fortune. Somebody bought this one and gave it to our church. They'd heard me say for years, I wish I had a pulpit Bible. And they bought one and gave it to us. It actually came with two pages out of an original King James uh, Bible, two pages out of the book of Acts, out of the first year printing. I have them at, at, our, at my house. And so it was very expensive. And uh, sometime you get a chance, be, be very careful with it. Um, if you want to come up and read it sometime, it is in um, uh, Old English. And so the spelling is different, F's or in the place of the S's. And it, it, can be, it can be a little uh, daunting to read from, if I could say that. And so the, the spelling, the, the words are the same, but they did use different letters during that time in the old English language. And uh, I, love, I love this thing. It brings back a piece of history. If the Bibles we have in our home uh, uh, were as precious to us as these pulpit Bibles were back then, we would be a much, much more uh, holier people. Would you stand with me if you're able to? And if you're not, I understand, but let's just stand. John chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In there lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, 
waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season unto the people, uh, unto the pool, and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Thank you. You might be seated there. It was not too many years later that because of the reputation of the, the, the miracles that took place season after season, I don't know how long, the season was, but it was a certain season, the Bible says. Not once a year, not necessarily um, uh, three times a year, but, but whatever season it was, at this season, the Bible says an angel went down and troubled the water. And there are so many, there are so many corrections of this. Uh, you start reading historically about the pool of Bethesda, and uh, you're going to find that people will tell you that this is an incorrect story that one of, the, one of the scribes added the part about the angel troubling the water to make it sound like a better story. Uh, anything could, nothing could be any farther from the truth. It happened just the way it happened. Now, one of the things I've thought about through the years when I would read this story is the cruelty of this story, how cruel this is. I think it's a picture of how cruel the world is to us. I mean, if you stop and think about this, that here... Here is this pool of Bethesda by, by the sheep gate. And, and what would happen is, is that through the years, the sheep were coming into Jerusalem, and they were coming in this certain gate, and they were going up to the temple to, to be sacrificed. And so the sheep had to be washed. And so a part of this pool uh, was sectioned off for the ceremonial washing of the sheep, so they would run the sheep through the pool. And uh, so around this pool... Uh, during this certain season, uh, whenever this season was, and I suppose the inhabitants of surrounding Jerusalem and Israel, word would spread. I mean, you know, all it would take is just one, just, just one to be healed, and word would spread all over the place. And, and so what happened was, was let, let's say that, that, that there was a, a man who had a broke arm, and they didn't set it right, and it grew back all crooked. And they came, and that water was troubled by that angel, and he got in first. He got in first, and that arm was completely perfect. I mean completely whole, as though it had never happened. You know, everybody that saw that would go around telling it, spreading it. And what would happen is more people would begin to come. At the next season, what would happen is, is, that, is that there would be somebody else who... Who, who maybe had some type of mental disturbance, and they would go in and come out perfectly whole. Then word would spread, boy, you got to get by this pool. Do you realize how many parents would bring their children to this pool? How many husbands would bring their wives? How many wives would bring their husbands? How many people, just, just at a chance, just at a chance to be the, the first one that stepped in that pool? Can, can you imagine all that the people would do can you imagine the gambling that began to go on? How they would turn something like that? How crooked! I'm gambling on this guy. I'm ga you, you know what had to happen? Bets would be taking place. Any kind, any way they could they could find to make money on it. Somebody's going to find a way to make money on this. There would be people there that would hire themselves out to try to get you in the pool first. There would be people. Undoubtedly, there were people before they realized how this was happening. There would have been people that would have got in the pool and stayed in the pool until the angel showed up. They would have been waterlogged, waiting for this angel to show up and trouble the pool. But it didn't work like that. They soon found out, no, you have to be out of the pool, and the first one that gets in the pool is the one that gets healed. So at, one, at a certain season, whenever this angel came, 
And I don't know how many years this went on, but this angel would show up and would touch this water. I do know that because the Bible says it. And, and whoever got in first, no matter what type of infirmity it was, no matter what kind of disease, no, what, no matter what kind of pain, no matter what it was, they would go, they would do their best to get inside of that pool. Now, word had spread through the years about this because the Bible says there were a great multitude of folk that were, that were crowded around, around this pool. This pool had steps that was going down, down to it. It was more than likely a pool that, that Hezekiah had, had, had built. There were two pools um, in, in, in the Bible that Jesus used as far as healing was. The pool of Siloam, where he told the blind man to go and wash the spittle off in the pool of Siloam, and, and, and he would come back seeing. That pool, that pool was fed by a spring. This pool was fed by rainwater. And so Hezekiah, back in the ancient days, had, had built duck work to go down and feed this pool. And, and they used it for the livestock or the sheep or whatever they wanted to. But at some time or another in history, there was an angel that came and went in and troubled that water. Now, I'm not exactly sure what it means by troubled the water. But generally, the troubled water, not steel water, saved up by, 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 by collected rain. But, but that he troubled the water would seem to lend the view that all of a sudden the water starts churning up like it's uh, um, like there's um, something under it. Like it's uh, all of a sudden there's a storm in the water or an earthquake in it, but it's troubled. They look and this pool all of a sudden becomes troubled. Maybe it starts looking like a sauna. I don't know. What I do know is the first one that got in, that got in was the one that got healed. Now, can you imagine the cruelty of, of, of to all the other people that didn't get healed? Can, can you imagine taking your child down there uh, season after season? You'd get there days ahead of time trying to get a place. Some people would go there and just stay there and lay a great multitude of impotent folk. They were blind, they were broken, they were halt, and they were lame. The, these people, here they are, and, 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 and their only hope, their only hope is they can get in first. Their only hope that the angel shows up and they can get in first. Now, I do not know that this is an angel of God. I don't know that. The Bible doesn't say that an angel came down. The Bible says, John says, that an angel went down. And so the went down means to uh, kind of uh, sound like that he's, He's walking down the steps and walks into the water. I don't think they could see him, but it doesn't say he came down. It could have been, it could have been that, that it was a fallen angel. They do have powers, you understand that. Just like the other, God didn't take away their powers when they fell. It could have been a bad joke that Satan played on them. As a matter of fact, a hundred years later, Rome does something. Rome takes this section of this pool and they build a temple there beside it, a small temple and a statue to a false god. And they began to claim that this false god is the healing power behind this. Now, I don't know that Satan started this and, and worked his way towards some form of idol worship or, or God was doing it to keep people's attention toward heaven. I don't know what the cause is. What I do know this is, what I do know is there's a man who has been lame, who is crippled, who has been in that state for 38 years of his life. And for season after season, month after month, day after day, year after year, that man has laid beside the steps of the pool of, 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 the pool of Bethesda waiting for the waters to be troubled. And every year his hopes get up. I can get in. Now, I want you to picture this crippled man. I, I don't know that he was paralyzed in the back. I don't know if he had a disease. All I know is the Bible tells us he's, he's been this way of a long time. He's been this way for 38 years. And so what I, what I see in this man is uh, somebody who didn't have handicapped parking spots during his time. Somebody that they, they didn't have wheelchairs during his time. Uh, somebody, they, they, they didn't even have good crutches. 
They didn't have walkers during his time. They had no rehab programs during his time. He didn't get a monthly check from welfare during his time. There was no social security benefits during his time. This man would have taken rags of old burlap and sackcloth and he would have wrapped it around his arms and his elbows because people didn't pick you up and carry you during that time. I want you to picture the sad state of this man. I want you to picture how horrible of a life this man had to live. I'm sure his mother or his father took care of him as long as they could. They helped him as long as he could. But then this man would get out of bed in the morning. Now, I don't want to get too gross here, but I want you to picture how horrible it had to have been for him. There were no handicapped facilities for him to go to. He couldn't get up and go to an outdoor toilet somewhere. He had a pot. He couldn't even pick himself up to put himself down upon a pot. Can you imagine the amount of the smell and the feces and the urine that was all over the place every time this man needed to go? Can you imagine seeing him, the filthy state that he was in? There was no running water. Uh, there was no faucet to turn up on. Uh, there was no tub to crawl in. There was no shower. There was no soap. Uh, why, uh, this man had to get on his arms and crawl everywhere he went. Uh, there was no form of work for him. He crawled on his arms. Can you imagine what his legs looked like? Can you see the dirt and the urine and the feces on his legs, on his clothes? This is not some clean guy. His old straggly beard that the Hebrews would wear drug down in the dirt when he got on his arms and he crawled. They would have a place where they would crawl to if they could make it to close to the temple. Now, that's where most people would give them the most money. No program, no food program, nothing like that for him to have. I'm telling you, this man's in a sad state. This man is in a bad shape. Boy, when you think you don't have something to be thankful for, you stop and read John chapter 5. It'll make you thankful. Your grandbaby's not crawling around on their elbows. They're not dragging their feet down through the mud. Uh, they're not having to uh, make ship somehow get their broken body up on a pot to go to the bathroom. Uh, they have no refrigerator to open up and grab them a cold drink. Uh, they have to take what somebody gives them. Can you see him on his hands and on his elbows pulling himself along dragging that broken body can you see him dragging himself down the streets of jerusalem hold his hand up there and beg for some money prop himself up against the wall he has to he has to go to the bathroom where he's sitting because there's nowhere else to go he can't do anything this man's in the sad shape what i'm telling you and then he hears about the pool of bethesda and he begins to think like every other lame person, every other halt person, every other blind person, if I can just get there and get in first, I'll be the next one to get healed. A little bit of hope is what he had. And so he goes down there by the pool, takes it, I don't know how far it was. But I, I can tell you, if it wasn't but just here the flagpole, that's a long way to drag yourself down a dirty street. Uh, that's crowded by, by people coming in and out uh, of, of the most popular city in all of Israel, in all the Middle East. If that's as far as he went, but it wasn't. If I understand what he did, he probably went all the way across the city, up and down stone steps, dragging his body across the gravel, through the spin, uh, through the garbage people threw down in, in, in the way. Can you imagine the mean kids that came by and kicked at him and spit on him and mocked him and made fun of him? Kids are cruel, you know that. I mean, there are a million things, a million ways this man had suffered until one day he gets down by the pool. And can you, can, can, can you feel his hope? He looks and he sees that pool and he's thinking, man, I, I'm going in next. Boy, he is all gone ho. I don't care. I, I don't care what it takes, but I'm going in next. He wouldn't have been there if he didn't think he wasn't going in next. And here came that angel down and troubled that water. And as soon as he got up on his elbow, somebody else was in. He didn't get too discouraged, did he? Because he kept coming back. 
He said, you know what? Not this year, but next year. I'll just hang with it. What have I got to lose? And he'd leave his house when that season came, and he'd drag himself across those old dirty streets, down through the mire and the rocks, and roll down the stone steps, and get up there and sit down and wait for the moving of the water. And he'd say, last year I didn't, but this year I'm going in first. But just as soon as the water got into trouble, somebody else got in. You see, there were a great multitude. The Bible says a great multitude of folk came. And every year there was more, and there were more, and there were more, and there were more. I can tell you this, if your child was crippled, you'd do anything on this earth to get their legs fixed. If they born blind, you'd do anything you could. You'd pay any price. My goodness, what, what, what price would you pay to be healthy? You'd spend any dollar amount to be healthy, to be real. You'd sit there and wait day and night and day and night. You wouldn't want to go to sleep, would you, because you was waiting for the water to trouble. And then somebody else would step in. But you come back next year, somebody step in. And year after year after year he comes and there's no hope somebody stepped in. I don't want to tell him this. If I walked up there and I saw him there, I wouldn't want to be the one to tell him, but you don't have a chance. You're never going to get in the water. You're never going to get in. You reckon anybody ever told him that? You, you might as well give up. You're never going to get in the water. I can tell you he's never going to get in the water. I can read this story and tell you he could stay there and die, but he's never going to get in that water. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the Bible says whoever stepped in first. It didn't say who rolled in first. This man can't move his legs. He can't get up and step in if he wants to. But whoever stepped in first, he just thought maybe it'll work for me, but his legs don't work. And somehow or another, the great king of kings, the great lord of lords came to Jerusalem and saw him. Out of all that multitude saw him. That water has just been stirred. Somebody's just gone away healed. And he comes there and he sees him laying across filthy and nasty and hopeless. And, that, and here's the thing. This man doesn't have a chance in the world. It's not a million to one. It's not five million to one. It's not five billion to one. I don't want to tell him, but he's got no chance. There's no chance he's ever going. He'd have to have a miracle to have the miracle because he's got to step in the water and his legs don't work so he can't step in the water. Now you might generalize that term and say no but what that means is no it means what it says. You have to step in the water. There's no mistakes in the word of God. But oh coming across the other side one day is somebody who sees a man that has no chance. Sees a man that his legs don't work, his life don't work, his only hope is a false hope. Looks at him and walks up to him. <laughs> and you see him kneel down there and look at him. You look at him and he, and he says, uh, Wilt thou be whole? Looked at him. And he said, when he saw it, them lay, wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to be healed? He didn't say yes. He said, well, it's like this. I have no man. I have no man. You know how many people in this world right now would have to say that? I have no man. I don't have anybody. I don't have anybody. There, there's nobody going to come help me. I don't have no man. I can't get in because my legs don't work. I have no man. You realize that you and I, the human race, was crippled through a fall. And if there was a magic pool somewhere where we could get in uh, to be completely whole, we couldn't get in if we tried because there's no man to help us. We, we fell. We fell from grace. And we were crippled spiritually from that fall. Crippled to the point of death. Whether you realize or not, the human race is like this man. We're dragging ourselves through the mire. 
We're filthy spiritually, filthy in the eyes of Almighty God, fallen, broken through sin and shame, and we're just dragging ourselves through life. Most of the world is dragging itself through life just, just hoping somebody will come along and change our demise. Take what's bad and make something out of it. But they don't ever show up. We try one magic pool from another magic pool. People run all over the world. They try this and they try that, trying to get some kind of relief, something to ease their pain, and they find no man can help them. The Bible tells us about a woman, and the Bible says this woman had an issue of blood, and the Bible says she had spent all she had on physicians but was nothing better. One day she heard that Jesus was coming. And she inched her way through the crowd. She bled. Everywhere she went, she bled. She was dripping blood when she went through the crowd. She was anemic. Her blood pressure was low. She was tired. But she thought to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I can be made whole. And she makes it through the crowd. And she reaches up and she touches the hem of his garment. Her blood pressure comes up. Her red blood cells are formed. She feels good. The redness comes back in her skin. She was no longer pale and sickly. And Jesus said, who touched me? She said, if I can just touch him. Here was this man and this man, this man who had no chance. He couldn't get to God. He couldn't get to the pool. He couldn't get to where there was help. He was completely helpless. And so God came to him, picked him out among a great multitude. Why? I, I, the only thing I can tell you is this. He had probably been there longer than anybody. He was probably in worse shape than everybody. He was probably more destitute and desperate and, and had lost all hope more than anybody. I don't know, but something about him caught the Lord's eye. And when the Lord saw him, the Lord made a beeline for him past all the others and walked up to him and looked at him and said, Wilt thou be made whole? And he said, I just don't have nobody to put me in the water. You know what Jesus said he was? He said, I, I, am, I am the water of life. I am a well of life springing up into everlasting life. I am the water. I am him. I'm the water that came out the rock. I am him. I am your life. That man found out that day that there was a God in heaven that cared about him, cared about his demise. And where a man had no chance whatsoever, a Savior came to him and brought him a miracle. Amen. Now, I don't know about you. But I know me, I'd still be dragging myself through this world had not he touched me. And I don't know about you, but I'd still be filthy and unclean had he not touched me. I, I don't know what he did because we don't know anything else about him. But if he's like the rest of us, I can tell you, I believe I know what he did. I believe he got up and leapt. I believe he was leaping. I mean, it wasn't like his legs just got some, some, some movement in them. No, his legs were completely whole. He got up. He was so strong, Jesus said, take up thy bed. He rolled up the, 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 the quilt and the blankets that he was laying on, filthy and dirty. He rolled them up, and he took off back home with them, wherever he went. I bet you he went somewhere and got washed off. I bet you he skipped along the way. I bet he went everywhere. As a matter of fact, he did. The Pharisees did everything they could to shut him up, and they could not shut him up. Amen. Isn't it a sad thing that here this man is, he's been healed. He's rejoicing. He's praising God, and all the Pharisees could do was rebuke him because he's carrying his quilt on the Lord's day. Isn't that something they have missed? They have missed the greatest miracle of all, and they have missed God Walking in the pool of Bethesda and then walking out, they missed him when he walked by, but not this man. He had no chance. Do you know how much of a chance a person has with Muhammad? Zero. You know how much they have with Buddha? Zero. You know how much they have on their own? Zero. You know how much they have from any of the gimmicks and, and, and works and religions or, or anything of this world? They had zero chance. This man had zero chance. The odds were all against him. He had zero chance until the Lord showed up. 
I bet you if you saw him after he got healed, I bet you he never had a day in his life again when he could reach down and move that leg. I bet every morning he woke up and put those legs out of that bed and thought, my goodness, he sure made a difference in my life. I bet you he got up. I, I, bet, I, I bet where he went, he had probably never been out of the city, walked outside the city of Jerusalem and looked at the fields for the first time. Walked down to where there was a running river, maybe by the river of Jordan, and saw it running for the first time. I bet the rest of his life everything was fresh and new and exciting. I bet every day he loved a day that he could just walk, feel his toes. I bet taking an old stone or an old knife or whatever they had back then, I, I, I bet he could take it and clip them old dirty toenails and loved every minute of it. Can you imagine the things he began to love that you and I take for granted every day? It was fresh. It was new. Spiritually, that was you. And that was me at one time. We were just dragging ourselves through the field. Until one day we dragged where we couldn't drag no more. And there he was. And basically he asked you and me the same question. You're sick. You're dirty. And you're dying. And you have no hope and there's nothing in this world that will ever help you. And then he looked at us. with those kind eyes. Those eyes, John said, were like a flame of fire. And he said, would you like to be well? What kind of fool, what kind of fool would say no? What kind of fool would say no? What kind of fool would say, let me think about it. I wonder what kind of fool would say maybe another time to turn around and crawl off on those old arms. What kind of fool would say no to an offer like that? All kinds. Not him. Not me. I sure hope the Almighty God, not you. You know what you and I are supposed to be to this world? We're, we're not supposed to be people who climbed out of the pit because we didn't. We're not supposed to be people who, who, who dug deep down inside of ourselves and pulled on our boots and, and, and strapped up and crawled up in the saddle again because we didn't. We're not supposed to be uh, people who, who pulled through, who got up, who got over, who cleaned their lives up. No, because we didn't. We're just supposed to be the ones that said, I will. And then he put the life in. You know, really, really, really all it took 38 years this guy was Saul crawling around Jerusalem. All it really took for people to know a miracle had happened. All he had to do was walk somewhere, wasn't it? <laughs> Isn't that simple? He just had to walk. All you have to do to let God, people know that God's done a miracle in you is just walk. Whatever God pulled you out from, whatever God saved you out of, whatever God did, just, just, just let him walk through you. And everybody will know they don't need a pool of Bethesda. All they need is Jesus. And he'll change everything. Father in heaven, Lord, I don't know this man's name. I'd like to. I don't know anything else about him. I'd like to. I don't know much about the pool of Bethesda. I'd like to, but what I do know is one day my creator walked in this place, 
walk down on the street. A man who had no chance, he didn't give him a chance. He gave him a miracle. There are no chances with you. Everything are facts. Everything is. And I love you for that. And I love you for the miracle of day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up for just a minute. Me and Miss Tina come down the drive this week. I know I say this all the time, but I mean it. We came down the drive one, one day this week. Oh, it was last night. We are walking down the driveway, holding hands. Looked at our house, and I said, look, baby, it's a miracle. Look at our life, it's a miracle. There's been one miracle on top of another miracle. Children went home Friday, and I said, look what we got to do. It's a miracle. Look at all the miracles around it's not just that the Lord came in my life one day. He said he came in and he never left. <laughs> he never left. He just kind of hung around all the time. And it just keeps on being another miracle. On top of another miracle. On top of another miracle. And the day of God has given you the ability to overcome what you couldn't overcome. Pulled you out of where you was at. He gave the ability to walk spiritually. Just walk. You don't need anything else. You don't need anything else. He's given all you need. Just walk. Just see. Just talk. Whatever he, whatever he brought you out of. Whatever miracle he did. Just let everybody else see it. And when they see that, they'll see him. It's not hard to see him if you want to see him. Oh, what a Savior. testimony before we go anybody got anything you need to share well praise the Lord Miss Tina. you know how many times I've heard you say that over the years here you know that it just keeps on it just amen he, he has we hear that all the time I'm never going to get tired of Brother Don. I got my promotion, Brother Don. I passed my test, Brother Brother Don. I never get tired of that. Anybody else? Uh, I'm never tired of him walking up to me and asking me, "Would you be whole?" I'm never tired of my Bethesda experiences with my Lord. Mm. Yes, Miss Larry. You help yourself. You just help yourself.
So praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. We sure will, Miss Mary. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? All right, Brother Phil, would you close us in prayer, Brother, please?